The Great Resignation is Coming, reported Allison Pohl in a June 13 Wall Street Journal article titled, How to Quit Your Job Gracefully. Pohl referred to the March Prudential Pulse of American Worker Survey a survey that found about 26% of workers who said they would start a new search for a new gig when the threat of the pandemic decreases. Globally, more than 40% of some 30,000 people Microsoft surveyed in 31 different countries indicated how they are currently considering leaving their employer before years end. Last Tuesday, CNBC reported how the great resignation is gaining steam as return to work plans take effect. The pandemic has caused a lot of people to reevaluate, particularly when it comes to work, reports Jessica Dickler. After spending more than a year at home, some workers don't want to go back to commuting, preferring the flexibility of remote work at least a few days a week. Others are simply burned out from logging long hours while also balancing child care and remote school, often all at the same time. And nearly all employees are ready to see what else might be out there. How many of you can relate? How many of you find yourself editing your resume by day while searching LinkedIn for new job opportunities or options at night? Or perhaps you're waiting to see how you will feel when you return to starting your day by putting on casual business attire instead of opening your drawer and hoping that there's at least one clean pair of yoga pants inside. Jesus and his disciples are moving on in today's text. They are moving on, but how do you know? when it's time to remain where you are, and when it's time to move on. Recent days have been filled with wild success. Jesus has calmed a stormy sea, destroyed a legion of demons, stopped the bleeding of a woman who has been hemorrhaging for 12 years, and has now just recently restored a 12-year-old girl who was presumed to be dead to life. He's now returned home to Nazareth, to his hometown, and we're told that his preaching initially stole the show. It impressed everyone in one breath, while leading people to criticize him the very next breath. Jesus has been able to draw a large crowd wherever he goes. He has cured hundreds, if not thousands, of people. He has extraordinary gifts the world desperately needs. And in every other community, Jesus has been able to perform wonders and signs with his many remarkable gifts. He has brought about needed change. But Jesus was not able to do much of anything in his hometown of Nazareth in the presence of voices who resist him instead of welcoming him and what he's able to do. Have you ever felt or found yourself in a similar position, fully aware of all that you can accomplish, only to have your spirit tarnished or your confidence diminished by the voices around you. In some ways, these verses of scripture enable me to understand why so many workers are feeling depleted, 
We know our gifts. We know how to use them to make a real difference. We've seen the fruit of our labor in all of the previous years, but the current circumstances of working on Zoom instead of in person, isolated instead of generating ideas in a boardroom with community, constantly adapting instead of having a steady flow of customers or clients, that these circumstances have not enabled us to accomplish much of anything, let alone be able to flourish. While we may have been riding high as a new decade began in January of 2020, the last 15 months have felt more like a Jesus in Nazareth season. A Jesus in Nazareth season where our gifts have gone unnoticed and hard work has seemingly been thwarted by people or circumstances that are out of our control. And rather than remaining in Nazareth, Jesus discerns that it's time to move on. He does not go alone when he does this, but instead he calls and commissions his 12 disciples to also move on with him. And he sends them out in pairs, a powerful reminder that we do not do ministry alone. And he gives them specific instructions for the journey. Do not take a staff that's regularly used for walking on rough terrain or for fending off a wild beast. Do not take a provision bag filled with food. Instead, remember that you are the equipment. You are what God will use to share God's all-encompassing love while healing the sick, casting out demons, and letting the oppressed go free. The same God who delivered the Israelites from the wilderness will be with you, will sustain you every step of the way. Oh, one more thing Jesus tells them. If people do not welcome you, just move on. The disciples follow Jesus' instructions. They go out and they healed people in body, mind, and spirit. They approached their work with joyful urgency, with joyful urgency because they knew that their work made a difference, that it had the capacity to touch and transform not only lives, but entire communities. And I wonder, I wonder if you know such joy. What jobs, tasks, roles, or responsibilities do you approach with joyful urgency? Because you know they make a difference while also enabling you to become fully alive. What would you need to shift or to approach in a different way to discover such joy? Prior to coming to Mount Vernon Place 16 years ago, I spent my days as the director of admissions for a seminary where I had the privilege of listening to sometimes simple and oftentimes profound stories of people who were responding to a call, a call to move on, to move on from one position, field or school to seminary and ordained or professional ministry. And some of our prospective students could articulate how they first felt called when they were 12 years old and stood in the pulpit and proclaimed the good news on Youth Sunday. Others, however, spoke of a role they once loved that had shifted or slowed down in a way that opened space for them to consider a new direction. I regularly wonder myself if I would have been able to hear God's call on my life, if I was in a job at the time where I showed up for work every day with joyful urgency. It's how my first chapter in Washington began when I first arrived in 1994 to serve as an intern in the president's scheduling and advance office. 
It was a role, a space, and a privilege that I adored. My first salaried position then was as the scheduler for a congressman from Ohio, where I received all of the requests for the congressman's time in Washington, put together his schedule, and made sure that he was always exactly where he needed to be. I approached that job with joy. I could hardly wait to do my work every day. And then the congressman was defeated that November. And two months after the elections, I found myself filing for unemployment in a large congressional hearing room. I would then spend my days at the DNC at a job center that had been set up. We didn't have home computers at the time. And I would go and I would apply for every political position that might have had my name on it. I finally landed a job working as a senator for, not as a senator, uh, for a senator from Iowa. And I was so grateful to be back on Capitol Hill. It's the place I wanted to be. But writing letters to concerned constituents about the farm bill or the Boundary Waters canoe area, writing those letters did not make my heart sing. Again, it was a privilege to work in the Senate, but there was little, if any, joyful urgency in my work. My joy instead came from volunteer roles at my church, Capitol Hill United Methodist, where my then pastor immediately recognized my gifts and extended invitations to share them. I chaired the administrative council. I led worship. And then I accepted a role to be a chaperone on a United Nations Youth Seminar in New York City. The only reason I said yes is because I'd never been to New York before, and it was an opportunity to go for free. I certainly wasn't expecting God to use that time to shift or to help me move on, to change my course. But that's what happened through a prayer in the middle of Manhattan. At the end of our journey, when my pastor got up and took the microphone that the tour guide regularly uses, invited us to bow our heads, and then thanked God for the time we had had in the city, for the safety that God had granted us. And then he said, thank you, too, for the ways in which you can use an experience like this one to call people. Will you please be with everyone whom you have called during this time in the city? as they discern their next step. It was like a bolt of electricity that went up and down my spine. And I spent the next four hours on the bus ride back to Washington, talking to other chaperones who happened to be pastors. Tell me about seminary. Tell me about the process that leads to ordination. I enrolled in seminary the next August, and I've never looked back. Instead, I have sought to approach every single day with a sense of joyful urgency. And I share this story with you because I wholeheartedly believe that God can, that God will, and that God is right now using seasons like the one we have just experienced to lead and guide and shift people in new directions. While it's tempting to believe that only pastors are called, we all have a call and claim that God has placed upon our lives. God is always, always working to lead us to places where we can use the gifts that God has given to us in ways that allow us to both give and receive life. So what might God be doing in your life right now? If your work is providing you with little joy or affirmation, what might God be doing in your life right now if you have discovered the rhythms of work and play throughout the pandemic that give you life, aspects of the season that you do not want to let go of? What might God be doing in your life right now if you spent the last year spinning your wheels while traveling nowhere? Frederick 
Beekner offers my favorite definition of vocation when he writes, vocation is the place where our deep gladness meets the world's deep need. Vocation is the place where our deep gladness meets the world's deep need. Where might God be guiding you right now to make a real and vital difference in a world that is in desperate need of healing? It might be in a job that you get paid to do, or it might be in the places where you show up and offer your time and your extraordinary talent as a volunteer. Last year, the beginning of the pandemic, many of us gathered for a retreat with the authors of a book called Another Way, Leading Change on Purpose. And the time together included reading a portion of the great theologian Howard Thurman's commencement address to the 1980 class of Spelman College. It's now widely known as the sound of the genuine. Listen to a portion of Dr. Thurman's words. There's something in every one of you that waits, that listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself. And if you cannot hear it, you will never find whatever it is that you are searching. You are the only one who has ever lived. Your idiom is the only idiom of its kind in all of existence. And if you cannot hear the sound of the genuine in you, you will all of your life spend your days on the end of strings that somebody else pulls. The sound of the genuine is flowing through you. Don't be deceived and thrown off by all of the noises that are part even of your dreams, your ambitions, so that you don't hear the sound of the genuine in you because that is the only true guide you will ever have. And if you don't have that guide, you don't have a thing. A few months ago, as part of a gathering with other clergy, I was invited to reflect upon my own sound of the genuine. What does the sound of the genuine sound like, look like? Where does it appear in my own life? I wrote down how my sound of the genuine is preaching my heart out and knowing that what I've said has impacted people in some way. Being with other people, literally walking through life with others, the joy and the pain, and leading change wherever I am. I then wrote down in my journal what the sound of the genuine is not. It's not saying yes to invitations that don't have my name on them, even though I think I should say yes. I wrote that it is not my time in Senator Harkin's office, and it's also not showing up to occupy a seat at a table if I cannot make a difference. Like the disciples in Jesus, I am eager to move on from any space where it feels like my unique gifts are not needed, where my unique gifts really don't make a difference. What about you? What work is at the center of who you are? What runs through you in a way that gives you life a way that you cannot wait to show up with joyful urgency to make a difference. Where do you most feel called to make a difference in this world as an employee or as a volunteer? How is God beckoning you right now to use your gifts, to ponder how it is that your deep Gladness might intersect with the world's deep need. Tell me, what does the sound of the genuine, what does it sound like? And how might you respond?
Amen.